These are thoracic radiology board view cases, and the topic of this group is anatomic variance in congenital anomalies. Good luck. What is your best diagnosis? So in this patient, we might have observed splaying of the tracheal bifurcation on the frontal chest radiograph and a relatively homogeneous density in the subcoronal region on the same chest radiograph. On this coronal CT image, we recognize a rather large, round, well circumscribed mass in the subcoronal region um, that is isoattenuating to soft tissue. The best diagnosis in this case is a bronchogenic cyst. Bronchogenic cysts can be discovered um, at any age, and they're usually asymptomatic and an incidental discovery. Um, however, with larger bronchogenic cysts, sometimes mass effect can result um, um, upon uh, the trachea or bronchi that can potentially lead to symptoms. Name this anatomic variant. So the anatomic variant is circled in magenta here. Uh, it's an airway that supplies the right upper lobe. Um, now, in this particular case, there's also a normal right upper lobe bronchus coming off of the, um, the superior uh, margin of the right main stem bronchus, which the yellow arrow is pointing to here. The anatomic variant is a tracheal bronchus. Which presentation is most common with tracheal bronchus? While recurrent local infection, persistent cough, stridor, and hemoptysis are all possible um, presentations of tracheal bronchus, the most common presentation is no symptoms at all. What's the difference between a tracheal bronchus and a pig bronchus? So while tracheal bronchi and pig bronchi are both airways coming directly off the trachea that supply right upper lobe, and not um, a bronchus coming off the right main stem bronchus. Pig bronchi are special in that the entire right upper lobe is supplied by a pig bronchus. While with trigger bronchi, a portion of the right upper lobe is still supplied by a conventional right upper lobe bronchus coming off the right main stem bronchus. We can think of a trachea bronchus as a supernumerary bronchus, while a pig bronchus is an entirely displaced right upper lobe bronchus. Um, if we were to adapt arterial vascular nomenclature, uh, one might call a tracheal bronchus an accessory bronchus, while one may refer to a pig bronchus as a replaced bronchus. Name this anatomic variant. And we have some axial images. So the anatomic variant here is circled in magenta. We have a blind ending, short um, bronchus um, that's arising from the inferior surface of the bronchus intermedius. Um, this is an accessory cardiac bronchus. Name this anatomic variant. So um, the imaging finding here is in the medial right lower lobe. Um, we have a tubular opacity um, that um, seems like it's um, arising from the um, lower uh, mediastinum here, specifically um, the esophagus that um, um, goes into the medial right lower lobe. And it's associated with a region of blacker appearing air trapped lung. This anatomic variant is an esophageal bronchus. Um, you see here the tubular structure connecting to the esophagus, basically a fluid-filled um, bronchus and some air trapping in the um, associated um, lung. Now, it's important 
not to confuse um, esophageal bronchial cases um, with a pulmonary sequestration, which can kind of look similar um, at first glance. So um, in the case of an esophageal bronchus, we have a region of air trapping with a tubular bronchial um, opacity that goes to the esophagus. Um, while with an intralobar pulmonary sequestration, what you have is also a region of air trapping, but in this case, the tubular opacity doesn't go to the esophagus, but it goes to the aorta. But you can see how the two can look somewhat similar. Identify this anatomic variant. So in this particular case, uh, we saw a left-sided aortic arch, but what we saw was a um, artery, a great vessel coming off the, um, um, the thoracic aorta, that courses posterior to the trachea and the esophagus. Um, you can see that both are kind of air-filled in this particular case because, because the esophagus is slightly dilated. Um, this is an example of a left-sided aortic arch with an aberrant right subclavian artery. Which patient is most likely to share this same diagnosis on these fluoroscopic images? So in patient A, we see um, some sort of structure that's indenting upon the anterior surface of the esophagus. Um, what we see here is enteric contrast within the esophageal lumen on a barium swallow. Whereas in patient B, we have a posterior indentation upon the esophageal lumen. Um, with a patient who has a left-sided aortic arch and an aberrant um, right subclavian artery, that aberrant subclavian artery passes posterior to the um, trachea and esophagus um, and could potentially um, push upon the posterior margin of that esophagus. So the answer here is B, and that's where the aberrant um, subclavian artery would be be on this particular image. And if we scroll down a few slices on that CT image um, stack, you can see here an aberrant subclavian artery coursing posterior to the esophagus. Um, and the esophagus here is situated between the trachea and that aberrant subclavian artery. What does patient A most likely have? Now, if we're looking at vascular variants, uh, the vascular variant that most likely would push on the anterior surface of the esophageal lumen would be a pulmonary sling. Um, and here's a CT image example. And you can see here the pulmonary sling coursing immediately anterior to the esophagus. And the esophagus here is situated between that pulmonary sling and the spine. What's your diagnosis? So we have a relatively well circumscribed nodular opacity that's avidly enhancing the same as um, the vessel in this particular case. And it's associated with uh, two rather large blood vessels. Just compare the diameter of these blood vessels, this peripheral to the lung with other blood vessels as peripheral um, elsewhere within the lung. Uh, this is a pulmonary arterial venous malformation. Which of the following statements about pulmonary AVMs is true? So pulmonary AVMs are not associated with tumors not usually associated with pulmonary arterial hypertension, and not usually associated with inflammatory conditions. Um, the true statement here is um, they are usually hereditary. True or false, HHT may be associated with cirrhosis. The answer here is false. Um, the association um, we're probably alluding to are um, those of acquired pulmonary AVMs with cirrhosis.
What's your best diagnosis? So the imaging finding here is a region of lung within the postural medial right lower lobe, which appears a bit more hyperlucent than the remainder, remaining um, more normal lung, um, which we also see on the left side here. Within this region of more hyper, uh, hyperlucent uh, lung are lots of thin-walled, um, round, um, kind of cystic spaces that remind us of the kind of the cut margin of a dishwashing sponge. Um, the best diagnosis here would probably be a CPAM, a congenital pulmonary airways malformation. Which of the following about CPAMs is true? So CPAMs are approximately a quarter of congenital lung lesions. They can involve part or an entire lobe. They communicate with the tracheal bronchial tree. That's how they remain air-filled, like on this case here. And they have a normal arterial and venous um, um, vascular supply. Um, answer here, there, four is E, all of the above. All of these statements about CPMs are true. List at least two possible fetal imaging findings of CPAM. So hopefully the two findings you came up with might have appeared on this list. Um, so possible imaging findings of CPAM include a solid or cystic mass in the chest, uh, maybe mediastinal shift, polyhydramnios, or fetal hydrops. Um, one quick thing about CPAMs, um, one way to kind of, um, kind of um, think about them conceptually is that they're basically hamartomas, um, hamartomas basically of terminal bronchial overgrowth. Which of the accompanying conditions may be seen with this disorder? So the chest radiograph and chest CT images were showing you a pulmonary arterial venous malformation, and we're alluding to HHT as the disorder. Um, stroke, nosebleeds, and brain abscesses these are all conditions that could be seen uh, in the setting of HHT. And so the answer here is all of the above. What percentage of patients with HHT will also have a pulmonary AVM? The answer we're looking for here is C, 15 to 35%. What's your best diagnosis? So the finding in this patient's lower left lung um, resembled actually that CPAM we saw um, just a little while ago, um, a region of more hyperlucent lung with this very, very bubbly kind of look of just kind of thin wall round cysts. Um, what's different in this particular case is we see that there's a um, rather um, 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 conspicuous um, systemic artery coming off of the descending thoracic aorta supplying this region of abnormal lung. The best diagnosis in this case is an intralobar pulmonary sequestration. Uh, now, just as a recap, uh, sequestrations in the lung can be divided between intralobar and extralobar types. The intralobar ones are the much more common variety. In an uninfected state, they'll look much like this case, uh, basically a kind of a hyperlucent multicystic um, structure within the lung. Um, when they are infected, they can appear more solid. Um, and more mass-like, but sometimes still feel a little bit of a bubbly character. Now, both intra- and extralobar sequestrations are unusual in that they have a systemic arterial supply.
Um, now, the venous drainage um, of sequestrations varies, though. Um, for intralobar sequestrations, they have more typical pulmonary venous drainage, whereas with extralobar sequestrations, the venous drainage is also systemic. Um, now, intralobar sequestrations um, exist within the visceral pleural envelope of an existing lobe, um, and they will communicate with the rest of the tracheobronchial tree. And that means that they're exposed to the environment, which means that um, particularly since the airways that connect um, the sequestration with the rest of the tracheobronchial tree may not necessarily be normal, um, um, secondary infections are possible. Now, extralobar sequestrations are enveloped in their own visceral pleural envelope and do not communicate with the tracheobronchial tree, so they're much, much more likely to remain sterile. Uh, one last note about feeding arteries with uh, sequestrations. The feeding arteries are not always visible. Sometimes they're just very small and hard to see, um, or there's no contrast to, to make them that obvious to you. So um, if you see a bubbly cystic lesion or bubbly cystic mass, um, don't necessarily exclude the possibility of a pulmonary sequestration just because you don't see that systemic artery. What's your best diagnosis? Uh, now this case should uh, remind us of the first case we saw in this whole series. Um, on the frontal chest radiograph, we had a um, example of a patient with um, splaying of the tracheal bifurcation and a relatively homogeneous opacity in that subcranial region of that image. On the CT images, of course, we see a rather large while circumscribed homogeneous mass that's iso-attenuating to soft tissue. And like that first case, this is also an example of a bronchogenic cyst. All are characteristics of bronchogenic cysts except. So bronchogenic cysts usually have a well-defined, thin, smooth wall, they are usually homogeneous in attenuation and don't enhance. The false statement here is statement D. Um, bronchogenic cysts are usually T2 hyperintense. Um, as we um, mentioned earlier, bronchogenic cysts are usually asymptomatic, incidentally discovered, but when large enough can cause um, mass effect resulting in um, narrowing of the central airways and potentially symptoms. Name this anatomic variant. So there's a couple of imaging findings on this image. Um, first off, uh, the heart is in the right side of the chest, and there's a stomach bubble in the right upper quadrant. We have a Swan-Ganz catheter course, which shows us that the atrium receiving central venous return appears to be in the left side of the chest. And there's no um, aortic knob um, in the medial left chest here. The anatomic variant we're showing you here is a case of situs inversus totalis. When it comes to um, situs, um, we have um, situs solitus at one extreme, uh, the normal anatomic configuration, and situs inversus at the other extreme, uh, a mirror image of the normal configuration. Um, now, Situs ambiguous um, falls in between these two extremes and is typically associated with duplication of right or left sides. Um, the way I recognize cases of situs ambiguous is by examining the tracheobronchial tree and perhaps the fissures of the lung. Uh, while the tracheobronchial tree is asymmetric in folks with situs solitus and with situs inversus, it's symmetric in folks with situs ambiguous. Now, we speak about body situs in medicine, but we also sometimes talk about atrial and ventricular situs, which come into play not only when we're diagnosing body situs, but also when we're trying to diagnose transposition of the great arteries.
Atrial situs refers to if the morphologic right atrium is on the right side and the morphologic left atrium is on the left side. Um, that's atrial situs solitus. Or if the morphologic right atrium is on the left side and the morphologic left atrium is on the right side, that would be atrial situs inversus. Um, obviously, this of us requires us to recognize what are the morphologic features specific to each atrium. And uh, one uh, uh, kind of feature that we find useful um, is to look at the shape of the atrial appendage. Um, the morphologic right atrium tends to have a broad pyramidal atrial appendage, while the morphical, morphologic left atrium tends to have a thin, narrow-necked atrial appendage. One other thing that helps us is that the IVC almost always connects to the morphologic right atrium. Now, ventricular situs. Um, Ventricular situs refers to if the morphological right ventricle is on the right side and the morphologic left ventricle is on the left side, that would be ventricular situs solitus, or if the morphologic right ventricle is on the left side and the morphological left ventricle is on the right side, that would be ventricular situs inversus. That requires us to recognize what the morphological features are um, that are specific to each ventricle. Um, so with the right ventricle, uh, we're usually looking um, kind of for the morphologic right ventricle, we're usually looking for trabeculated walls and a tricuspid valve connected to it. Whereas um, features specific to the left ventricle, the morphologic left ventricle are smooth walls and a connected bicuspid valve. In a normal patient with situs solitus, the atrial situs and the ventricular situs are normal. While in a patient with situs inversus, the atrial situs and the ventricular situs are both reversed. Now comes your question. How would you fill out the rest of the chart? So with congenitally corrected transposition of the great arteries or L transposition, the circuit that a red blood cell takes around the body is the normal circuit because the transposition of the great arteries is unreversed, basically, by transposition of the ventricles. In folks with congenitally corrected L transposition, the atrial situs is normal, but the ventricular situs is reversed. Now, with D transposition, there is no ventricular transposition, so the atrial and ventricular situses are both normal. Uh, now the, the third column here. In L transposition, the ascending aorta is usually anterior and to the left of the main pulmonary artery, while in D transposition, the ascending aorta is usually to the right of the aortic root, like in normal folks. But in the D transposition cases, the ascending aorta is anterior to the main pulmonary artery rather than posterior to the main pulmonary artery, like in normal folks. Um, here we have um, examples of a normal patient, uh, standard anatomy, situs inversus, L transposition, and D transposition. Um, and we can see um, in the normal um, patient um, a morphologic right ventricle on the right side. There's a, a moderator band even visible here. Um, you can kind of get a sense of trabeculation within that morphologic right ventricle, um, while the walls of the left ventricle are a little bit smoother. And we can see that there is a relatively non-dilute contrast within that morphological right atrium because it is receiving um, systemic venous return. In the case of situs inversus, um, we can see that the ch uh, ventricular chamber that's on the left side of the, the uh, kind of the septum here has a much more trabeculated appearance, characteristic of a morphologic right ventricle, while the ventricle that's right of the uh, ventricular septum has a much smoother wall, characteristic of a morphological left ventricle. Um, and we can see relatively um, non-dilute contrast entering the atrial chamber that's to the left of the um, atrial septum in this particular case, the morphologic right atrium that's to the left of that patient's interatrial septum. In the case of um, L transposition, um, 
you can see the really pronounced trabeculation uh, within the uh, ventricle that's to the left of the ventricular septum, which is actually a morphological right ventricle, whereas the ventricle that's uh, to the right of the ventricular septum has a much smoother wall characteristic of the morphological left ventricle. So you can see in this case, the right and left ventricular, uh, the morphologic right and left um, ventricles have um, basically switched. Um, and it's a little bit hard to see in this particular image, but the um, atrial chamber that's right of the um, atrial um, septum is actually the one that's receiving um, a non-dilute, uh, uh, sorry, non-contrast enhanced uh, IVC blood return. Finally, in the um, lower left-hand um, corner, lower right-hand corner here, we in the case of uh, detransposition, uh, we can see that uh, the ventricular chamber to the right of the ventricular septum has trabeculation um, and a moderator band typical of a morphologic right ventricle. Um, the morphologic left ventricle having a smoother wall is left of that ventricular septum. And um, we can even see a central venous catheter in the um, atrial chamber to the right of the um, atrial um, septum, um, the morphologic right atrium in this case on the right um, side. Um, the next image here just um, shows a relationship of um, the ascending aorta relative to the main pulmonary artery in each of these four conditions. Um, the ascending aorta is right of the main pulmonary artery in normal um, anatomy and detransposition cases, uh, but in detransposition, the ascending aorta is actually anterior to the main pulmonary artery. Now, with um, the other two cases, the ascending aorta um, is uh, left of the main pulmonary artery um, in these cases of situs and versus in L transposition. Now, in both L and D transposition, notice how the ascending aorta is anterior to the main pulmonary artery. Provide at least three differential diagnoses for a retrotracheal mass. And we can see the uh, retrotracheal mass highlighted with this um, magenta uh, circle here on this lateral chest radiograph. Um, there's a lot of um, differential diagnoses actually for a retrotracheal mass. Um, you know, when we think of um, um, uh, retrotracheal mass of great vessel origin, um, we might want to consider um, aortic uh, aneurysms or pseudoaneurysms. Um, a left arch with an aberrant right subclavian artery or a right arch with an aberrant left subclavian artery where the, um, the kind of the origin of that subclavian artery is a little bit um, kind of um, dilated, um, like a comeral diverticulum. Um, double aortic arches and pulmonary slings could also result in what appears to be a retrotracheal mass. So um, these are all possible um, uh, different diagnoses of grade vessel origin. Um, focal esophageal dilation or even a focal esophageal tumor in this location could potentially uh, manifest as a retrotracheal mass, as could uh, an enlarged kind of uh, group of lymph nodes or an enlarged single lymph node. Uh, bronchopulmonary foregut malformations uh, could look this way, as could potentially a, a mediastinal hematoma. So the differential diagnosis for retrotracheal mass, in effect, is um, you know kind of based a bit off the differential diagnosis that we learned for middle mediastinal masses. And uh, you might have remembered this uh, table that we uh, showed during the uh, middle mediastinal talk, um, um, just to kind of trigger our memory into. Um, the kind of um, the um, main systems to think about. The three conduits that always are present uh, within the middle mediastinum could give rise to masses, um, tracheal grade vessel or esophageal origin, the two masses that are only present if abnormal, namely lymphadenopathy and bronchopulmonary foregut malformations, and the one intruder um, thyroid. Um, next case, what's your best diagnosis? So this is an example of a pulmonary sling, um, also known as an aberrant left pulmonary artery. Um, pulmonary slings can sometimes narrow the right main stem bronchus, um, in which case um, symptoms such as wheezing, um, pneumonia, or respiratory distress could result um, in patients who are truly symptomatic um, from 
a pulmonary um, sling, sometimes a surgical reanastomosis may be considered. So there's an anomalous venous structure here. What structure is it draining into? And this anomalous venous um, structure um, is draining into the coronary sinus, right there. What's your best diagnosis? Um, so best diagnosis in this case would be a left-sided SVC. All of the following statements are true about left-sided SVC, except So left-sided SVCs um, can be associated with congenital heart disease. Uh, with left-sided SVCs, the duplicated form, where there's uh, basically an SVC channel on both sides, is more common than just an isolated left-sided only. And patients are usually asymptomatic. The statement that is not true here is um, C. Um, with um, um, a duplicated or a left-sided SVC, um, you're still um, having systemic venous drainage into the right atrium, um, so there is no shunt present. What's your best diagnosis? So this is a rather classic example of an intralobar pulmonary sequestration. Um, this is just highlighting that really pronounced um, arterial, um, systemic arterial branch supplying this region of abnormal lung. In this particular case, the, um, the sequestration um, was infected. Which are more common, intralobar or extralobar sequestrations? So you may remember from the earlier pie chart that intralobar sequestrations are the more common, um, constituting three quarters of sequestrations. True or false, intralobar sequestrations more commonly present in neonates than extralobar sequestrations. The answer is false. Um, because of the um, higher association of extralobar sequestration with um, congenital anomalies, um, they're often kind of picked up uh, while those anomalies are being worked up. Intralobar sequestrations um, are, have a much lower association with congenital anomalies and tend to present more in kind of early adulthood um, in patients who have just recurrent um, lung infection in the same kind of region of the lung because of that sequestration, that intralobar sequestration. How, does, um, how do extralobar sequestrations usually present? Well, um, extralobar sequestrations uh, rarely present as lung infection. Um, more common presentations are neonatal respiratory distress feeding difficulty and high output uh, congenital heart failure due to the associated congenital anomalies in folks with this diagnosis. What's your best diagnosis? So the best diagnosis in this case is a bronchogenic cyst. What are the typical MR signal characteristics of um, bronchogenic cysts? So on MRI, um, bronchogenic cysts are almost always um, hyper-intense on T2-weighted imaging. Um, their signal intensity on T1 is a bit more variable. And that depends on what's inside that particular cyst, how much protein, how much blood or mucus content there is. True or false, bronchogenic cysts may be found in association with pulmonary sequestrations or congenital lobar overinflation. And the answer here is true. What are the most likely reasons a bronchogenic cyst may abruptly increase in size? So abrupt increase in size in uh, a bronchogenic cyst should lead us to consider the possibility of either hemorrhage or infection. 
provide at least two possible di uh, differential diagnoses. So within the um, right lower lobe in this patient, we have a region of um, kind of bubbly um, uh, lung that reminds us of a kind of a, a dish um, washing sponge. When we see this kind of appearance, um, the two things I think about first would be an intralobar sequestration that's infected or a CPAM that's infected. Um, we don't really go low enough in this particular image to see if there's a systemic artery or not supplying this, so it's be hard to differentiate what would be your number one, what might be your number two answer. The two other differential diagnoses to consider might be a lung abscess or a lung malignancy. A lung malignancy, we're probably referring to like a lipidic um, subtype adenocarcinoma, which can sometimes look sort of like this. Um, this particular um, patient had a type 2 um, CPAM that was um, infected. Um, as we alluded to earlier, um, these CPAMs are basically a, a hamartoma, effectively, with um, 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 terminal bronchial um, overgrowth and suppression of um, more peripheral alveolar development. The three classic types of CPAM, type 1, 2, and 3, um, I'm sure this uh, distribution on this pie chart. Um, the definition of these um, um, CPAMs by type um, is the next question we have for you. How are they defined? So um, CPAMs have traditionally been de um, defined by the size of those cysts. Um, if at least one of the cystic spaces is at least two centimeters in size, um, that usually results in a type 1 uh, label. Uh, malignant transformation is possible in these, um, but the degree of risk is not well um, um, established. Um, type 2 CPAMs are characterized by sub-centimeter cysts. Um, congenital anomalies are somewhat common in this, with the, um, these particular CPAMs, um, but the risk of um, malignant transposition, uh, malignant transformation is almost nil. Um, type 3 CPAMs are associated with microscopic cysts that really are not visible on imaging, um, so they look to us like effectively like a solid mass on macroscopic imaging um, and um, no um, uh, risk of malignant transformation. The other two types, type 0 and type 4, uh, were types that were established a little bit later after the first three types were defined. Um, type 0, uh, very rare. Um, usually, um, uh, unfortunately, um, patients die at birth. And type 4, um, from an imaging perspective, is uh, pretty much indistinguishable from type 1. Um, type 4 is our associative tension pneumothoraces and malignant transformation um, possibility. What's your best diagnosis? So we saw a region of relatively hyperlucent lung within this right lower lobe that's supplied by um, a systemic artery coming off of the aorta. Um, so this is another example of an intralobar pulmonary sequestration. Um, this brings up the question, why do in these intralobar sequestrations when they're in, in an uninfected state look blacker? Um, um, than the normal uh, surrounding lung. Uh, that's because of air trapping. Uh, the reason basically is, is um, the airways that uh, connect this intralobar sequestration with the rest of the tracheobronchial tree are not quite normal. So airflow is not entirely normal coming in and out of those um, connections. However, um, collateral air drift can provide air to that sequestration from the rest of the normal lung within that lobe. So air can get into the sequestration through collateral air drift, but due to those abnormal um, central airways, um, the air may not always leave efficient, efficiently, which le results in um, air trapping within that intralobar sequestration. True or false, intralobar sequestrations are more commonly infected than extralobar sequestrations. The answer here is true. Intralobar sequestrations have some sort of communication with the rest of the tracheobronchial tree and therefore exposure to the environment. Um, so they are more prone to infection than extralobar sequestrations, which are enveloped in their own um, visceral pleural envelope with no connection with the rest of the tracheobronchial tree and the environment for that matter. <laughs>
True or false, most common site for sequestration is posterior left lung base. And that is a true statement. Um, half of intralobar sequestrations usually present after age 20, so we're talking kind of young adulthood, um, whereas over half of extralobar sequestrations, extralobar sequestrations um, present before six months. So there's a kind of a difference in how intra versus extralobar sequestrations tend to present from an age spectrum of the patient. Uh, intralobar sequestrations usually present as infection, uh, specifically recurrent infection of that sequestration, whereas extralobar sequestrations rarely present as infection because they're usually sterile. Uh, they'll probably more likely present in the setting of the workup for associated congenital anomalies. Name this anatomic variant. So in this case, the heart is in the right side of the chest, and the PIC course um, shows us that the atrium receiving central venous return is in the left side of the chest, and there's also no aortic knob in the left chest. This is another example of situs inversus totalis. All statements are true with situs inversus except So, um, statement A is true. The atrium receiving pulmonary blood return is on the right side. Um, the atrium receiving systemic blood return is on the left side. Um, statement B is true. The right lobe has the right lung has two lobes, and the left lung has three lobes. Statement C is true. The stomach is right-sided. The false statement is actually D. Polysplenia. Polysplenia um, is a finding we typically encounter in the setting of situs ambiguous. With situs inverses, we still would expect to see a single spleen. Um, polysplenia um, would be very rare um, in the setting of situs inversus. All statements are true with situs inversus except. So the atrium receiving systemic blood return is on the left side. That is a true statement. The left lung has three lobes and the right lung has two lobes. That would be a true statement. The IVC is left-sided. That is a true statement. And the liver is left-sided as well. That is also a true statement. Um, so in this particular question, all four statements are true. Which of the following statements is true? So this is a question about Cartagner syndrome, also known as dysmotile cilia syndrome. So these are all referring to the same um, disorder. Um, statement A is true. Um, Cartagner does consist of a syndrome with nasal polyps, chronic sinusitis, bronchiectasis, and situs inversus. Statement B is true. Cartagner um, is present in about 20% of patients with situs inversus. And statement C is true too. So about 50% of these folks have situs inversus. So answer here is all of the above.